global striker for climate. So, Professor Giovannini, you have the floor. Good morning. It is uh, an honor for me to be here today, and I'd like to thank the organizers, in particular Letizia Moratti, because she invited me uh, for the second time to uh, attend this event. My slides are in English, but I will be presenting in Italian. First and foremost, responsible growth. Uh, responsible in in of what in what way of the GDP growth of the GDP I worked for the OECD I was then president of the National Statistics Agency and I fought uh, to go beyond GDP that does not mean that economic growth is not important on the contrary I will try to show how the real problem stems from that too. But very briefly, I will try to summarize that uh, growth uh, also pertains to well-being, growth of well-being, more than that of the GDP. These are two references. One is the report. I know I have to go fast through my slides, but please. So the one is the report of our Association for Sustainable Development, and another is a book that I uh, published last year, Sustainable Utopia. This is a report of the World Economic Forum on global risks. It's a classic map uh, of risks, which entrepreneurs will be familiar with. Uh, and you can see the events uh, are ordered in the likelihood of them actually occurring. And you have then the axis which shows the impact. Uh, high up uh, on the right, you see those with the greater impact and greater likelihood of actually occurring. And here you can see climate change, for example, water crisis, mass migration, unemployment. So these are just some of the concerns uh, that more than that most leaders around the world actually have. And the answers are based on this report. What is the future that we don't want? The future that we don't want is what the OECD showed us in a report uh, of a couple of months ago. High up, you can see that uh, growth rate expected for the GDP of in various uh, areas of the world. So in developing worlds, we have about 1.75% uh, for the next 40 years. There are many entrepreneurs here with us today. Do you think that uh, a growth rate of the GDP of 1.75, uh, do you think that with that the capitalist system can actually continue? So you can see that we're talking about economic sustainability, but at the same time we're talking about uh, social sustainability. On the right you can see this uh, report, the relation between the income of the richest and the poorest, again forecast by the OECD to grow following the strong growth uh, of the past few years. Why? Because the mechanisms of, the ca of current capitalism uh, leads to greater inequality. And then of course you have the problem of climate change, here you can see a map of of the European Environment Agency. On the left, uh, you can see those European areas that will benefit from climate change, whilst on the right, you can see those who will be uh, harmed by climate change. And then you can see the impact of the Industrial 4.0. Those of you who wanted to find out more about it can read the uh, report uh, on uh, future developments. Uh, a report uh, which I was a part of uh, drawing up. Uh, these are again OECD uh, results uh, which show that about 10% uh, of uh, the work uh, being carried out uh, today it will actually disappear, 10%, but 40% will change radically in the way it is performed. So we may have, may not ha always have the resources for continuous education or manage even to manage to uh, manage this change at a social level in 2016 at an event uh, organized by the European Commission on the future of uh, Europe 
These were the key words. So this non-linearity and asymmetric shocks, which are just becoming the new normal. And we're seeing this. So the conclusion is, imagine the unimaginable and thinking the unthinkable. And this report is a report I invite you all to read. It is a report based uh, on about 80 interviews to leaders uh, throughout the world. And it explains how our organizations are incapable of being prepared for epoch-making changes. Epoch-making changes, well, these are the forecasts uh, of uh, the Rome Club. Uh, based on a famous report of 1972 on growth limits. On the right, you can see in the red line the population which was growing up to 8 billion by 2030 to collapse and hit 6 billion by the end of the century. Those continuous lines are the effective uh, uh, going on of the variables. In the middle, you can see that there's a fall in food supply, the green line. So that led to a decrease in industrial and service output, and this determined the total collapse of the system. The fact that 40 years later, we are still in line with what had been forecast in that report is rather worrying. Because in the last 40 years, we have changed everything. Despite this, we are still within these lines of business as usual. So someone might say, well, it's a bit exaggerated. Well, these are some uh, graphs from the latest report on global risks, which really struck me. Because you can see high up there on the left, the number of wars and conflicts throughout the world, which is at its highest level ever. I didn't actually realize that. Uh, if you look on the left uh, at the bottom, you can see the number of deaths in these uh, wars. So many, but, um, and on the right there, you can see malnourishment uh, rates uh, and famine rates. Uh, this, these levels were going down for many years, but in the last few years, we've seen again an uptake. So the question we need to ask ourselves, and this is the first element of our responsibility, our, each and every one of us has this responsibility, and I believe in this scenario, or rather the question should be, are the, is this a real scenario? Do I believe that scientists, economists are all lying? That it's all deception? Or is there a real risk behind all of this? Because if there is a real risk, then we have no time to lose. That is the conclusion to be drawn. In many cases, we have even reached the point of no return. And this is the first responsibility that all of you today actually have. I'd ask the technicians if you could please press that button there on the left. It's a video that I'd like to show you. We talk a lot about uh, non-sustainability. If you could please remove the uh, audio. Thank you. So here you see two monkeys which need to do a task. They need to move a stone. They receive a piece of cucumber. The one on the right receives a, a grape. The one on the left does the task, receives the cucumber. <laughs> and as you can say, as we would say on a talk show, he gets really mad. The one on the right does the task, receives again a piece of grape. The one on the left, the cucumber was fine until then, but suddenly doesn't even try the piece and throws it back. When we think about uh, unsustainability, the fact that nature is rebelling against us, the planet is rebelling, the real issue is what will people do? What are people doing? Because unsustainability stems from there. It stems from our societies. We heard about uh, Agenda 2030 which is a way to face these problems. 
It is the highest form of uh, global consensus on these issues. It has to do with poverty, with food, nutrition, education, health, gender equality, water. And this is a major change. Economic growth, energy, innovation, and of course, uh, the environment. With this agenda, we went beyond the idea that uh, sustainability just means environment or compatibility between economy and environment, because the four pillars of the agenda are all equally important. And it, th there's this integrated uh, approach that is missing, because we think in boxes, in compartments. And I apologize to those of you who have already seen the next uh, graph, but I wish to reiterate uh, that it's very important to show it to you because it's the best way to get across the message of integration. Here you can see the way the world actually works. We get from the universe uh, solar energy, we emit heat, and everything else happens within the planet. We get human capital, social capital, economic capital. We combine it all in production processes, and we create GDP, goods and services. A part of that is reinvested, and a part of that is consumed. The way in which we produce affects the well-being of people. And if we have slaves, slaves, about slaves. In that report, or rather commission on the future of work, we looked at an idea about the compatibility of businesses. And what we focused on was the idea that people are actually seen as a cost. Have you ever heard about managers who say to their employees, you are the true heritage of our uh, company? Unfortunately, though, people cannot be seen as numbers uh, in the so form of the heritage of the company. So there is a rule that states that uh, people are not the heritage uh, or the goods and the assets of a company because they're not under the complete control of that business. There was a period in which people, human resources, were seen as the goods or assets, uh, but that is because they were completely controlled, and that is when they were slaves. So to indicate that difference compared to the past, we see them as a cost now. It's not that we actually took any uh, steps forward in the right direction, but it creates an interesting effect because you can see there that waste, uh, what we get rid of. We produce waste that can be physical, which impacts uh, well-being, so plastic, uh, garbage, also impacts the services of the social system, or rather, I beg your pardon, says the speaker, the ecosystem. So our countryside, our landscape, uh, uh, the, our bees that pollinate uh, for us. Uh, and this is a fundamental aspect of our responsibility. My wife uh, is an advocate of uh, the ecosystem in fridges. She says you need to open your fridge, uh, be very quick and get the air out uh, and rather close the door as quickly as possible so that there's no, um, to, not an excess release of energy. You need to close the, uh, turn the tap off when you brush your teeth. Uh, there are these are the little things that we can all do. But the true problem is that uh, production systems continue to release waste uh, in an unsustainable manner for the planet. But then there is also human waste. As the uh, Pope's uh, encyclical states, so we're referring to the poor, to the marginalized. And when we talk about circular economy, which is uh, a trendy term at the moment, we have understood that we need to recycle things, goods, objects. But we haven't understood that if we don't also recycle people, and I use the term recycle, we are creating an unsustainable system at a social level. Many of the things that we see around us, also in political terms, are the result of people's reaction who have understood that there is no future for them. Just think 
of the 650,000 employed in the construction sector in Italy. Typically, people who have uh, received little education. And the message they have received is that, well, if you want to find a job, if you want to find a good job, you need to be IT programmers or, or work in artificial intelligence. But that's not available to all. In a previous government, if we had passed a government against uh, soil consumption, then we would have an entire construction sector that would have been relaunched through the renewal and requalification uh, of uh, urban areas. So when we make political and uh, economic decisions, we need to think in these terms uh, that are interconnected. That is our responsibility as people who with uh, an above average education compared to the rest of the population. We also have a specific responsibility, in particular businessmen have a specific responsibility, and this is my dream, to say to journalists who interview us uh, on one of the many talk shows we have here in Italy, when journalists, for example, were asking last summer on the uh, one of the laws passed here in Italy, according to you, three, four, or five uh, renewals of um, fixed contracts. Is that possible? Is that? And that seemed to be the problem of the entire Italian economy. And I was expecting entrepreneurs to answer as follows. You haven't understood the crux of the matter. That's not the future. The future comes from circular economy. Yes, if we continue to use the cost of labor per uh, production unit as an indicator of competitiveness, and we forget that through t that today, through technology, we can actually reduce our costs by 70% and not just by 30%, then a business that needs more people, that is in the circular economy, that needs more people to manage a circular economy will be more competitive because it has reduced its costs and also increased its profits. This is the change in mentality that we actually need. And the responsibility of people who generally have uh, more education and who are working uh, on these problems from within to create this raised awareness. But the reason why I'm showing you this uh, uh, graph, graph here, or this diagram rather, is to show you that we have these 17 SDGs, and it's no longer a list, but it becomes a plan to change the world. I realize that we need to dedicate time to something like this, to understand its revolutionary potential. I realize that if we talk about sustainable development, and I'm referring to my moderator, this is something that is usually discussed, this is usually dealt with by the environmental section of the newspaper, not by the economic section of the newspaper. But uh, take, for example, Mercedes and their I decision to invest uh, billions in the development of elec electric batteries based on potassium to counterbalance the old uh, investment uh, of 10 years ago of the Chinese, uh, which was a lithium-based uh, battery. That is a geopolitical problem because Europe is rich in potassium, whereas it does not have lithium. It comes from regions in the world that are already under uh, Chinese uh, dominion. So this is the kind of responsibility we should be exercising. But can we do it? This is the last report from the Club of Rome. And a number of simulations were run in four different scenarios. And this graph sums them all up. On the right, you have the goals set by the 17 uh, that we believe we can achieve and on the left the number of planetary constraints planetary complaints that scientists have identified and in 1980 at the beginning of the curve that you can see we were complying with eight constraints and we had about eight point something goals 
that we had more or less achieved. By 2015, uh, we'd achieved half a goal more than that, but we'd breached another three planetary goals constraints. So what are we looking at in the future? The first scenario is red. The red one, business as usual. As you can see, there is an improvement on certain goals, and that makes sense because we've taken 200 million people out of extreme poverty, roughly 2 billion people out of extreme poverty, strike that, and the economy is continuing to grow, particularly not in the West, but uh, this is causing positive effects. But in then in, by 2050, we'll be breaching two more planetary constraints, limits. So the orange curve shows growth, growth, growth. Everything is based on uh, GDP growth, and uh, there is a, an acceleration on certain in certain aspects, but uh, you know we're sort of breaking even. Yellow curve, well, we've got the SDGs, we're taking them seriously insofar as we're doing a little bit more about employment, about education, about healthcare. So we're making a few more efforts across the board mm, in, ter in mainstream terms. So we're improving, but we're certainly not solving the problem of planetary constraints. And the green curve shows radical change, a radical change in approach, meaning that it doesn't go without saying that we'll be able to avoid a total collapse. In fact, quite the opposite. It's highly likely that the crash will affect massive populations around the world, huge numbers of people. And if you don't want to act like those rich people in Silicon Valley who were building bunkers in New Zealand, as per the New York Times article uh, quoting a direct source, then our responsibility, our responsibility is to try and follow that green curve. Maybe the yellow one, but definitely the green one. Last comment uh, before going on, all around the world, um, people are working on these subjects. This is a, a report by the World Forum for Science, and it shows how very interconnected and integrated the SDGs are. And the good news is that it's not true that everything depends on everything else and that it's all too complicated to deal with this issue and to change our mindsets. There are some goals that are positively interconnected. In other cases, the interaction is negative, and so there are certain trade-offs. In some cases, uh, they're neutral. But the good news is that if you want to take these issues seriously, you can certainly uh, access a, a lot of literature on the subject. And I'll conclude with Europe, because one of our responsibilities will not only be to vote hopefully all of us, at the upcoming European elections, but to indicate where we want to go, where we, direction we want to head in. And this is the OECD report on the big challenge for those keen to change, not just businesses, but also countries. And it is basically all about the consistency, the coherence, the consistency of politics. And the good news is that here too, huge efforts have already been made about changing European policies, and this is the report by an independent uh, uh, agency that worked for one parliamentary group of the European Parliament that I sat on at the time, and it came up with this report, and it indicated more than 100 concrete proposals as to how to change European policies around these 10 um, subjects and goals. Well, next week could be a very important week because the European Council has to decide whether or not to officially approve a pass a resolution on including Agenda 2030, placing it at the center of all future European policies, which means that the cohesion funds, innovation feed funds for uh, the economy, et cetera, et cetera, will all have to be based upon 20, the Agenda 2030. And those businesses, those regions, those countries that have not set themselves up to change their mindsets and their attitudes will be penalized. So some will be angry with with the pen pushers up in Brussels, but ultimately it will be the fault of national systems if they that have not taken this paradigm shift to seriously enough. And hence, this is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to ensure that these subjects between now and the 26th of May are in fact at the center of the debate, 
uh, based on our differing positions and stances, public and private, because in fact this is uh, an important hub. It's a, an important crux. It's the crux of the matter. And if the European Union, after selling the concept of sustainable development to the world, uh, can it continue to be the champion of sustainable growth for its own economy and for its society and for its environment? Well, this is the responsibility that we all share. This is the challenge that we're called upon to stand up to, and I hope we respond positively to that challenge by saying, yes, I will shoulder that responsibility to change the world, because not only is it possible, but it is fair and correct and right. Thank you.